Okay, good morning, everybody. Time, time to start. Thank, sorry for the technical problems. So for those of you who are online, apologies also, we had a few technical problems. Welcome to this new seminar in, in ecology and evolution from Montpellier. As usual, for those of you, of you online, you are in a webinar mode, which means that your mics are switched off. Uh, if you want to ask questions to today's speaker, please use the Q&A tab uh, on, on Zoom. And then uh, when it's your turn to ask your question, we will switch on your mic so that you can uh, ask your question directly to the speaker. And if you, if you have any technical issue, please report in the, using the discussion tab. And so uh, I leave uh, Alexandra, I, I give the floor to Alexandra to Introduce Thank you. Today. I'll be quick. Uh, I'm delighted uh, today to introduce our speaker, Manveer Singh, who is a cognitive and evolutionary anthropologist. Right? Um, Manveer did his PhD at Harvard, uh, finishing in 2020 in human evolutionary biology with uh, Joe Henrich, for those who know him. Uh, he's done a lot of fieldwork in Indonesia uh, among the Mentawai, I don't know how to pronounce it. And after that, did a postdoc in France, in Toulouse, at the Institute of Advanced Study. He's now just being offered a post uh, of um, assistant professor at UC Davis. Uh, briefly, his research focuses on cultural evolution, why it's culture the way it is, and why societies develop complex but recurrent uh, traditions. And it's got various topics of research, including um, what, related to law, religion, and art, and including shamanism, witchcraft, um, origin myth, music, uh, and, 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 and more. And beyond research, you can check his website as well. He writes a number of pieces and essays for the um, lay audience in popular media, uh, including The New Yorker and The Guardian. Um, we're delighted to catch you before you, you go to the US. Um, and yeah, um, go with you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Alex, and thank you everyone for having me. I'm really delighted to talk to this group. Um, so, like Alex mentioned, I study these recurrent complex traditions, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So human societies regularly develop suites of strikingly similar behavioral traditions. They have magic and religion. They have aesthetic behaviors like music, and like story. They have institutions that regulate social relationships. They have justice. They have marriage. So these ubiquitous cultural traditions are at the core of my research program. In particular, I'm interested in two broad questions. First, um, what are the forms of these complex cultural universals? So what are the patterns of universality and diversity in these recurrent cultural behaviors? Oh, second, sorry. Um, and secondly, why do they appear everywhere and take particular forms? So these are not new questions. Um, in fact, they're some of the most foundational in my field of anthropology. In 1896, the pioneer of American anthropology, this uh, German-American scholar Franz Boas published a paper in science that started like this. So he wrote, modern anthropology has discovered the fact that human society has grown and developed everywhere in such a manner that its forms, its opinions, and its actions have many fundamental traits in common. Later in that paper, he goes on, many attempts have been made to discover the causes that have led to these recurrent um, ideas that develop with iron necessity wherever man lives, this is the most difficult problem of anthropology. So in this paper, Boaz lays out that this is the central question, but people should put it off. They don't know enough about culture. They don't know enough about psychology, about ethnography, about human diversity. So now more than a century has passed, and we've learned an incredible amount about the mechanics and origins of the human mind, about cultural diversity, the histories of diverse peoples, about evolutionary theory and its relevance to our biology and our culture. So my research is about leveraging this progress to return to this very difficult question that Boaz had identified. Now, the, the broad framework that I work within goes something like this. Oh, sorry. Um, the goal is to explain human behavior as the outcome of different evolutionary processes, one of those is genetic evolution and everything that entails, including natural selection. Um, now, at some point in our evolutionary history, we evolved a brain that gave rise to a second set of evolutionary processes, uh, cultural evolution. 
So these represent two inheritance streams, and of course, uh, they interact in all kinds of really interesting ways. So I study human behavior as the product of genetic evolution and everything that entails, phylogenetic constraints, natural selection, cultural evolution, and this interaction between them. And now the goal is that through studying these long-standing anthropological puzzles, we not only improve our understanding of human behaviors, of religion, of law, of art, but also we gain this better understanding of what's going on in these, in these red lines, how it is that our diverse evolutionary history, these diverse evolutionary processes interact to shape human behavior. So the, the approach that I take and the way that I'm going to structure this talk is in three pillars. So the first is explanatory. It's developing theoretical explanations, both for particular sociocultural domains and broader cultural evolutionary processes. These explanations are then informed and tested by two empirical pillars. One of these is comparative research, and the other is ethnographic fieldwork. Now, in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to go through these pillars. I'm going to provide an overview over, over many projects, but dig into a couple of key examples. And I'm ultimately going to try to develop an understanding of the questions that drew this talk and, and of the research, how it is that evolutionary processes produce these ubiquitous complex behaviors. So let's start then with some theoretical explanation. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, wait, maybe this will work. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, so the driving question, just to remind you, is this one. Why does a complex sociocultural behavior, behavior appear everywhere and exhibit certain features? And again, this goal is to both explain these important sociocultural behaviors and advance our understanding of how evolution shapes behavior. Now, in my work so far, I've, um, like Alex talked about, worked on topics such as shamanism, witchcraft, justice institutions, and story. Today, for now, uh, in this beginning, I'm going to zoom in on shamanism, which is something I find very intriguing and, and interesting. So I'm going to define shamans here for you as specialists who enter trance, by which I mean these apparently non-ordinary states, to provide services, especially healing and divination. Shamanism appears to be ubiquitous, so Peoples et al. showed it to be, um, they actually found it in 26 out of 33 foragers, but I went through some of the ethnographies and I think it's 29 out of 33 in their sample. Um, Winkleman looked at a subsample of the standard cross-cultural sample. So this is essentially a pseudo-random sample of human geographic and cultural diversity. He found shamans in 43 or 47 societies. Shamans include uh, practitioners that have been called witch doctors, mediums, trans channelers, even many religious prophets. Um, shamanism is also the only institutionalized division of labor beyond age and sex in many small-scale societies, leading some anthropologists to call it the first profession. Now, the leading explanation of shamanism in the evolutionary and cognitive literature is what is called the integrative theory, put forward by Michael Winkleman. The integrative theory proposes that shamanic practices, they, they occur worldwide because they induce this cross-culturally consistent trance state that is characterized by greater integration, greater connectivity among functionally specialized brain networks, networks that normally do not communicate, now, as a result, Winkleman has argued, trance is useful. It enhances problem solving, it promotes social intelligence, leadership. The shaman is better at locating game and coordinating people at resolving conflict. So this integrative theory is a functional hypothesis. It hypothesizes that shamanism reliably evolves because it is good for the group or it is good for clients that exist because of objective benefits. Now, in contrast, I've developed what I will call right now the subjective model of shamanism. I refer to it as subjective because I will argue that shamanism develops not because of objective benefits, but because of subjective appeal. So now shamans themselves usually benefit as people seek them out and as they pay them. But the argument is that the practice culturally evolves. It reliably develops to adapt to or hack our psychology to convince a community that the specialist can control uncertain outcomes. Now, to explain shamanism, we first need to understand why people use magic 
or superstitions. That is why they rely on these actions that seem to have no causal effect on their stated outcomes. Ah, okay. Um, so I, I'm therefore grounding this model in an adaptationist theory or view of magic. So I'm building here on a lot of existing work, including some, some modelings that's cited here. But to get a sense of this idea, consider smoke alarms. And note that I did not make up this analogy. Many of you might be familiar with this. This is used more generally quite often to think about and explain adaptive but error-prone cognitive systems. Randy Nessie, for example, used it in his book, Good Reasons for Bad Feeling. But the idea is that smoke alarms can have two kinds of errors. Uh, they can have false alarms, so they can report a fire when there is no fire, and they can have misses. They can fail to report fire when, when it's actually there. Now, both of these are costly, both of these are errors, but I think we'll agree that misses are much more costly than a false alarm. A miss can mean death, a false alarm just means being distracted for a little bit. To be optimally designed, then, smoke alarms need to be calibrated to minimize costs of errors. We need to avoid these very costly misses, meaning that we make alarms very sensitive. Uh, thus ending up with this fair share of false alarms. By analogy, then, we can think of magic, we can think of superstitions as the false alarms of evolved mechanisms that serve to detect useful causal relationships. So the cost, on average, of missing useful, useful causal relationships outweighs the cost of adopting some ineffective techniques maintaining superstitions. Now, this theory of magic is consistent with observations about the context in which humans use magic, in which they use superstitions, and they, in which they use rituals. Um, particularly, work has shown that we're most likely, we're more likely to use these when first uh, the cost of a behavior is low compared to the potential benefit of, of influencing some outcome, and the outcome occurs randomly after the intervention. So accordingly, people use magic, rituals, and superstitions to influence important uncertain outcomes, healing illness, influencing the weather, um, improving agricultural harvests, harvests, doing well in a, in a sports match, and so on. So we've established then that humans are a superstitious species, that there are adaptive reasons for, for concluding this. The argument is then that there is a cultural selection uh, for magic that is most psychologically compelling, most intuitive. Specifically, the idea is that as people speak out those magical methods that seem most effective and as specialists compete to provide them, they jointly drive this cultural selection for intuitive magic. Magic that because of our psychological bias that appears compelling and effective. So the outcome of this cultural evolutionary process then is shamanism. That is the argument here. Now, what is it about shamanism that makes it so cognitively appealing? Uh, what I have proposed is that core features of shamanism, trans, dramatic initiations, uh, these convince the community that the practitioner is different from normal humans, making their claims of special abilities more tenable. Now, this objective model uh, makes predictions about features of shamanism. Uh, one of those is shaman's jurisdiction, like what they should do, what kinds of services they should provide. Oh, oops. Uh, the subjective model predicts that shamans should overwhelmingly deal with important, uncertain outcomes. This contrasts with the integrative theory that we saw earlier, which Winkleman has said predicts that shamans should act as leaders. Uh, it also contrasts with placebo theories of shamanism, which are also relatively common. These are theories that hypothesize that shamanism develops as a technology for inducing the placebo effect. And these quite straightforwardly predict that shamans should treat illness. So I tested among these hypotheses using Wenkelman and White's 1987 uh, database. They coded trans practitioners in 43 societies. Again, remember this subsample of the standard cross-cultural sample. Oops. Um, here's what I found. So black bars are domains of uncertainty. White bars are leadership roles. Striped bars are life cycle transitions. And what we see is that as predicted by the subjective model, shamans overwhelmingly deal with uh, domains of uncertainty healing, divination, ensuring good harvests. They do take on healing roles consistent with the placebo uh, theory, and they do actually take on leadership and consistent with the integrative theory, although leadership is, is uh, much less frequent, uh, while healing is not exclusive, or, or is, it's just one of, of several domains here. Now, this paper goes into the ethnographic and the psychological evidence in much greater depth, the, the takeaway that I want to highlight over here right now, though, is that it shows 
how a complex recurrent behavioral tradition can reliably develop because it culturally evolves to satisfy our evaluation criteria for achieving a shamanism evolves because it best, oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna use the keyword. Um, shamanism evolves because it best convinces people that they control these uncertain outcomes. Now, in fact, this has been a theme in, in much of my explanatory work. So just as people want to control uncertain outcomes, they want to satisfy retributive urges while restoring cooperation. They want to explain misfortune and demonize rivals. They want to entertain and be entertained now, this is a pro process that more recently I've called subjective cultural selection. The idea that culture evolves not to maximize necessarily individual or group level benefits, but rather as people selectively retain variants that they subjectively evaluate as satisfying their goals. People craft culture to do what they want. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes they're mistaken. It really depends on how we evaluate culture, what kinds of psychological biases are involved there. So shamanism, justice, witchcraft, hero stories, all by this logic, develop as we craft traditions to satisfy subjective ends. So those were, that, that is kind of an introduction to the theoretical approach over here. Now let's move on to some empirics. Um, I'm gonna start with comparative research. Now we just actually saw a little bit of comparative work with the shamanism project, but the, the project that I'm gonna present here and is, is much more systematic and ambitious in its scope. So the question guiding my comparative research is this one. How does a sociocultural behavior compare across human societies? And again, this is useful for uh, it's useful for generating explanations. You can't explain justice or music or whatever without actually understanding what it actually looks like. Um, but they're also useful for testing theoretical predictions of these accounts. So I've conducted comparative work or am conducting comparative work on music and story. And on witchcraft, right now I'm going to just dig into music. So I've investigated music through a project called the Natural History of Song, um, which I co-direct with Sam Mayer and Luke Lowacki, and which we've worked on since 2014. The Natural History of Song aims to answer this question. What is universal about music and what varies? This then speaks to a question of broader theoretical interest, which is how did music genetically and culturally evolve? The natural history of song is composed of two parts. Um, the first is what we call NHS ethnography. This consists of some 5,000 descriptions of song from 60 diverse societies. Each description is coded for more than 60 variables. Second is NHS discography. So in its first iteration, this consisted of 118 original field recordings, specifically that was four song types, a dance song, a love song, a healing song, and a lullaby from each of 30 world regions. Each of these recordings is then annotated using four methods, music information retrieval software, um, naive listener ratings, expert ratings and transcriptions. So this was the first iteration. We've actually finished expanding the discography considerably to about 1,600 songs and covering many more behavioral domains, um, processions, funerary songs, uh, songs to, to welcome guests. So I'm gonna spend some time digging into one NHS project in particular. So this was published in 2018 and I co-led it with Sam Mayer. In this paper, Sam and I and our colleagues set out to test one domain of universality, form function associations. Now form function associations are common in biological and cultural systems. They are in fact a characteristic of adaptive and functional design. Um, so with that in mind, we asked a simple question. Um, do songs that share behavioral functions exhibit common musical features? And as you'll see by behavioral function here, I mean ends like dancing, healing, and putting a baby to sleep. So now if song does exhibit form function associations, we should expect two findings. First, naive listeners should identify the function of songs from their form alone. You play a song for a naive, naive listener, they should be able to reliably guess what that song is for. And second, songs that share social functions should have, of course, common form. So we tested these predictions across two experiments. The first was conducted with 750 uh, MTurk participants in 60 countries. You can see the participants' locations on that map. 
Each participant listened to a 14 second excerpt of a field recording in our discography, and then they rated it for six social functions. We had them rate the four functions of interest, uh, dancing, healing illness, soothing a baby, and expressing love, and then two others, telling a story and greeting visitors. Each subject listened to 36 excerpts, meaning about 25,000 ratings in all, or 225 ratings per song. So what did we find? Here are some results. You're gonna see many plots like this one. Um, so the points here represent the actual songs in our discography, the uh, y-axis are people's ratings, and then the x-axis is the, their actual category. So what this is showing is that on the dimension to soothe a baby, people rated lullabies considerably higher than uh, any of these other ones. So people reliably identified that lullabies were used to soothe a baby. Um, here are the ratings for dancing. So you can see that people were quite good at identifying that dance songs were for dancing. Naive listeners were able to identify that foreign dance songs were for dancing. And we, we chose clips where we tried to remove uh, cues, like the sound of a baby crying. So they were randomly chosen, but then we listened to the random excerpt. And if it had like a baby crying, for example, we would, we would remove it. Um, they recognized that healing songs were, were used to heal illness. So the, the effect is not as strong as with dance songs and lullabies, but there is uh, nevertheless an effect. They could not identify that love songs were used to express love. Um, so in this study, we found no effect on average. People could not identify love songs above chance. They did um, report that these songs were higher on dimension telling a story. So they could tell that there was important semantic content, suggesting that maybe that's more important for, for defining a love song. So next we asked how universal this effect was. We um, addressed this specifically by asking, do listeners around the world share conceptions of what songs should sound like? So for instance, do people in the US and in India have a similar notion of what a dance song is? To answer this question, we designed the experiment so that we had three equally sized subsamples. We had 250 participants from the US, 250 participants from India, and 250 participants from the rest of the world. This is just a constraint of how MTurk was working at the time. Um, so again, you're going to see a couple of plots like this. I know that like 3D plots aren't the great, the best to show on in two dimensions, but so each point represents a song in the database again, um, and the colored ones are of the relevant domain. So we are looking at songs to sue the baby here. Uh, they're shown in green, and they're plotted on the uh, ratings of the of the three samples. So what this plot is showing with an R squared of 0.97 is that if someone in India, for example, or if our participants in India rated a song very high on To Sue the Baby, as did our participants across the world and as did participants in India. Uh, we show a similar convergence on ratings for dancing. Again, R squared of 0 0.97. Um, and it admittedly, or, or again, convergence on to heal illness. So there's admittedly more variation here. Um, I mean, it's still quite a high R squared, but given that healing songs were perhaps the most foreign to our listeners, it's striking to see that they nevertheless shared these mental models of what these sound like. So returning then to our predictions, we find evidence that naive listeners could identify the social functions of songs from their form alone. What about the second prediction though? Do songs that share social functions have similar forms? Um, to address this second prediction, we ran a second experiment. This time, 1,000 listeners, uh, only in the US and India this time, we used the same excerpts. Rather than rating function, however, they rated form. So this included musical features like melodic complexity, rhythmic complexity, tempo, et cetera, and contextual features. So the number of singers, the gender of singers, and the number of instruments. So I'm not gonna go through all of the results, but here are just some of the findings for, for musical features. And what you can see is that on all four of these dimensions, on melodic complexity, rhythmic complexity, tempo, and arousal, um, we find that dance songs are consistently rated the highest and lullabies are consistently rated the lowest. And in fact, when we ran a PCA of the musical features, 
we found uh, that dance songs here in blue separated from lullabies here in green. So dance songs were arousing, they're fast, they're melodically complex, they're rhythmically dominated. Lullabies were in contrast slower, less arousing, less rhythmically dominated. So we at least comparing dance songs and lullabies find uh, indications that, that songs that have distinct functions tend to have these convergent forms. So we find evidence for, for the second prediction. So a limitation, of course, over here, which you might be thinking, is that we conducted this experiment only with internet users who are competent in English. Um, so the generalizability of our findings are therefore quite, quite limited. For that reason, we've also run versions of this experiment now with speakers of 28 languages across 49 countries. This includes speakers of Amharic, Korean, uh, Urdu, and we've, oh, sorry. And we've also run this study, versions of this study in three smaller scale societies. So with the Mentawe of Indonesia, the, the Nangatam of Ethiopia, and the people of Tana in Vanuatu. So notably our findings replicate in these other populations. So here, for example, are inferences about dance songs. And you can see that both in the um, uh, 49 countries and in the smaller scale society, we find um, that listeners can accurately uh, identify dance songs on this dimension for dancing. We found the same effects for healing songs and for lullabies, although not again for, for love songs. So since this 2018 paper, we've had many more findings with NHS here, some major ones. So in our analyses of the ethnography, we find that musical behavior varies along three dimensions. Um, formality, arousal, and religiosity. We find that within society variation on those dimensions exceeds between society variation by about six times. We find that across societies, song tends to be consistently used in at least 20 behavioral contexts like dance, uh, love, processions, play, warfare. And finally, we found further evidence of these form function associations we later computationally identified the features that distinguish not just dance songs from lullabies, but each of the four domains from each other. So in a new review paper, Sam and I draw on our findings with the natural history of song, as well as some other recent experimental work to address this question. Have humans biologically evolved specialized cognitive adaptations to respond to music? For example, have we evolved to dance? Have we evolved to respond to lullabies? Um, so we, we look at three signatures of adaptation, or, or at least three features of musical responses that can help us make inferences about adaptation, universality, ontogeny, and domain specificity of these responses. And what we conclude is that as of now, both from our research and from the literature more generally, there is evidence of, of universality, the kind of evidence that we've shown people tend to respond to uh, musical stimuli similarly, although there is interesting variation that we can talk about. And there is reliably development, reliable development, but we find no strong indications of domain specificity. Um, rather, it seems from the existing research that emotional and behavioral responses to music, including to dancing, there's like a really interesting literature on how dancing might be a byproduct of other systems that we can talk about later, um, suggest that these are byproducts of other cognitive adaptations. Um, so ultimately, our work with the natural history of song, combined with other recent literature, indicates that shared features of human psychology predispose people everywhere to find certain songs appropriate for certain emotional or behavioral contexts. We thus conclude in the paper that these musical universals emerge, or, or at least they are shaped, um, as people selectively produce and retain songs that appear to best satisfy their behavioral goals. So people craft, they evaluate, they retain music that, that achieves ends like soothing babies, promoting dance, communicating happiness, et cetera, thus driving these, these cross-cultural patterns. Okay, so that was the um, comparative research. Now let's move on to the, some field work. So like Alex mentioned, since 2014, I've been conducting field work with Mentawe people on Siberut Island here in Indonesia. Uh, most of the field work I've done has been um, in this yellow region and on this river of Rereket, the Sarereket region. Um, although I've also worked a bit in these other regions as well. 
A reason that I started fieldwork on Siberu is that, as you can see, it's covered with these rivers. Um, the communities on each river are, are a bit culturally distinct. They speak slightly different dialects. They have slightly different taboos. Um, and the idea was that by examining practices and beliefs across these rivers and across these cultural regions, one can examine which cultural traits are stable and which are more liable to vary. OK, so some background about the Mentawe. Uh, the Mentawe people are Austronesian. They are um, traditionally rainforest horticulturalists. So the staple of the diet is sago. They also, um, or it's a sago palm. You process the starchy pith. Um, they grow tubers and many fruits. Um, they also forage. Um, they raise pigs and chickens. They are increasingly quite integrated into the market. They um, are organized into patrilineal clans known as Uma. Um, they traditionally lived in long houses, also known as Uma, as well as small houses surrounding them. Today, they have a mixed residence. So most people will live in settlement villages, like what's pictured here. Uh, these are known as Varasi, although many families also maintain houses in the forest where they tend to pigs and they hold ceremonies. So this is a picture of a settlement village. These are the houses that the government builds. Um, here you can find banana trees. You can see sago palm in the back. Um, here's a clinic. And all of these people are actually watching as a um, like a bulldozer comes in to, to create a road. So my fieldwork involves both quantitative and qualitative methods. This includes participant observation, open-ended interviews, uh, systematic surveys, and some experiments. So this is the psychological or the music experiment that we saw findings of earlier. As you'll see, a major focus of the fieldwork is to collect primary rich behavioral data. Um, also, for anyone who is wondering, these men who are tattooed and who are wearing loincloths are sikere, shamans. OK, so similar to the comparative work, the fieldwork has two major goals. These are first, uh, characterizing social and cultural behavior, usually with the aim of further building theory, and then testing theoretical predictions. The, the project that I'm going to dig into right now is an example of a, of a project that such would address both of these aims. Um, and the central question of that project is, what is the role of third parties in maintaining cooperation, especially in small scale societies? So there are two main answers to this question that have been put forward in the literature, both of which are relevant also for thinking about the evolution of human cooperation. So one is punishment, third party punishment. There are many lines of evidence. These include experimental studies, uh, theoretical models, some field studies, suggesting that human cooperation is at least partly enforced by third party punishment. In fact, authors such as Rob Boyd have gone so far as to argue that third party punishment is really important for human evolution, for human social evolution. However, other results uh, such as economic games and surveys of ethnography suggest that third party punishment may in fact be rarer in smaller scale societies, particularly those of foragers and uh, forager horticulturalists. So another way in which third parties might contribute is mediation. The idea here is that partner, cooperative partners often end up in disagreements about whether and to what extent a transgression has occurred. They thus call on third parties, especially those perceived to be disinterested, to mediate and help restore cooperation. So in recent modeling work, um, Boyd and Matthew actually provide evidence that cooperation, reciprocal cooperation is not possible without mediation, suggesting that, they, that it may have been critical for, for human social evolution, or that's the conclusion they made. Um, yeah, so if we assume occasional errors, what they show is that reciprocal cooperation is not possible without mediation. So this project thus sought to test the extent to which third parties engage in punishment versus mediation in the Mentawe context. Now to test the relative importance of punish and mediation, I drew on a long-term data set that I've been compiling on transgression and justice in Mentawe. So a bit about the data set, it comes from 199 interviews conducted with 95 individuals, including at least one member of every household in the primary study community. Uh, it currently comprises 444 cases of transgression, but because most of these are retrospective, uh, we use a set of stringent exclusion criteria 
to, to ensure the most reliable cases. And, and so 302 pass the, the exclusion criteria. A really important point is that in Mentawai, punishment and mediation are ensconced in an indigenous institution of justice. So 80% of the cases collected involve the payment of a fine, a, a, what is called thulo. Um, and thulo payment has a particular protocol and it's, uh, these payments are typically paid in resources like pigs, chickens, cooking pots, durian trees, and so on. Just to get a sense of, of the kinds of conflicts that are occurring here, um, here's just a sample of these, of, of some of the major ones in the data set threatening someone, harassing or fondling a woman, using harmful magic, adultery, impregnating an unmarried woman, inducing bad luck by breaking taboo, saying the name of a dead person, spreading malicious rumors, um, and then destroying and damaging property, stealing properties, the, the biggest one. We'll see in a couple of slides, you'll see how big uh, theft is, particularly of pigs and, and killing pigs. So for every case, I collected a, a number of variables, including the composition of the fine, the details of mediation, what happened if it went unpaid, and the identities of the parties involved. Um, some background about the institution. So the Mentawa uses this phrase, tabbe tilinia, tabbe tulonia, to describe the magnitude of fines. This means one, one replacement, one tulo, where tulo essentially here means penalty. And so the idea is that a fine should be equivalent to twice the value of a lost or damaged resource. You killed my pig, you owe me two pigs, for instance. Fines typically go from a transgressor and their relatives to the victim and their relatives. Um, in fact, it's often said that a clan will fine a clan. Nevertheless, the parties involved can be quite fluid and variable. So I have a case in which a son and his wife find uh, the, the son's father, uh, another in which several lineages and a fine and a clan got together to find an errant member. So before I move on to the results, I just want to clarify some of the terminology I'm going to use. Um, second parties are those directly harmed by a transgression. Aggrieved parties are the close patrilineal relatives, their first degree relatives, so the, the children or the parents and the spouses of second party individuals. And third parties is everyone else except aggressors and aggressors close kin. So the reason in this paper that we are distinguishing between aggrieved parties and third parties is because in Mentawe, clan membership creates corporate responsibility. Um, I need to pay for my patrilineal cousin's wrongdoing. I will likely receive resources when my, my cousin is attacked. Close patrilineal relatives are to some degree substitutable in the context of transgression. So it doesn't make sense or, or at least feel appropriate to refer to these individuals as third parties. They share responsibility. So moving on to the results then, um, we find uh, no evidence of direct third party punishment. So here we're considering third party punishment on a continuum from least costly. So demanding a fine or even paying a mediator to visit a transgressor to the most costly, that is attacking a transgressor or seizing, seizing resources. We found, a no, we found no case in which a third party demanded and received the fine. Um, that's probably to be expected. Beyond that, in Mentawai, there is second order punishment. So people can be punished for failing to pay a fine. It's, uh, it's typically a seizure of resources. It's called uh, tuka ake. It was observed four times and simply such second order punishment was always imposed by the victim themselves, never by a third party or even a, an aggrieved party in these, in these cases. So third parties did not directly punish, but perhaps third party concerns still regulate punitive justice. For instance, people might pay fines to maintain good reputations among third parties, or the threat of coordinated violence may ultimately ensure compliance. Alternatively, punitive justice may be regulated by dyadic concerns. So by this model, people are paying fines to repair reciprocal relationships and third parties care little about what happened. To be frank, when I got to Mentawai, I had really assumed that this is how the system was maintained, um, that the community was ultimately the arbiter of justice. Um, but based on quantitative and qualitative ethnographic data, I think the second model is actually better supported. Punishment seems less a third party concern and more a result of dyadic negotiation. 
So I'm going to go through some of the evidence right now, but I'm glad to expand on this afterwards. So first, many transgressions go unpaid. This is a ridge plot. The values of different fines are on the x-axis. Uh, the category of the transgression is on the y-axis. Um, you'll see that really severe infractions appear on the top. So impregnating, sorcery, sex, molestation. You can see like pig, 41 cases of pig. That's the next most common one is stealing or, or killing a chicken. These are the, the really like, common infractions among the Mentali in the community, among Mentali people in this community. Um, really trivial infractions are here on the bottom, stealing a banana or taking some taro, taking sago grubs. Um, what's key is that the distributions are bimodal. So many transgressions are not followed by, by punishment. Now this, of course, does not necessarily mean that uh, third party concerns do not indirectly enforce, but, but if they do, they are at least substantially failing. What I think is more important, however, is that as predicted by dyadic accounts, punishment, in this case, fine payment, is more likely when dyadic cooperation <laughs> is under greater threat. So one way to look at this is to compare transgressions within clans to those between clans. The idea is that a between clan transgression is more likely to un unravel cooperation and punishment is thus more important than a within clan transgression where kinship and long-term reciprocal relationships already bolster this relationship. And in fact, this is what we see. Um, between, clan trans between clan crimes uh, are punished more often. So you can see on the right, we have the results of a Bayesian logistic regression. Fines are more likely um, for more severe transgressions, this is what we saw in the last slide. Um, and they are meanwhile less likely when, uh, when disputants come from the same plan. Now, moving on to mediation, I'll just start with some background. Um, so in the part of Siberu where I work, disputants can either call a mediator or they can resolve a conflict face-to-face, -face, what is called pamata mata. Um, traditionally, the mediator would be a go-between. Uh, today, there's still some go-between mediation, but there's also in-person mediation and government mediation, although governmental mediation is done by individuals drawn from the local community and is structured near identically to in-person mediation. We have some interesting results. I'm not going to go through them here, but about how governmental mediation might be taking the jurisdiction of local leadership. Um, so that's also something I'm glad to talk about afterwards. So of the 217 cases for which we have relevant data, roughly half of them involved some kind of mediation. Um, we examined some of the predictors of being called as a mediator, which I'm showing here. Uh, note that only adult men are called as mediators in this community. Uh, so we're examining the demographic predictors of being a mediator restricted to, to an adult man. So the reference level here is a non-elder, non-shaman. And so what we are seeing is that elders, both senior elders and junior elders are more likely to be called as mediators and Sikere, these shamans are more likely to be, to be called as, as mediators. Um, we find that third parties are overwhelmingly called to mediate. More than three quarters of non-governmental mediators do not share clan membership with either disputant. However, it's hard to know how to interpret this. Um, so to determine whether people are actively seeking out third parties, what we did is we simulated the estimated frequency of third party mediation under a scenario where people are randomly calling upon shamans, elders, and household heads to mediate. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these results in too much depth. depth. Um, I'm glad to return, them, return to them. But in short, what they suggest is that people do not actually, in this context, seem to seek out third parties to mediate. Instead, they seem to seek out shamans and elders, sikere and elders, many of whom are incidentally third parties. Stepping back then, what we find, we find no evidence of third party punishment and little indication of indirect enforcement. Otherwise, um, we find that third parties are often called to mediate. So remember some three quarters of the time, although it's unclear whether they're actively sought out as opposed to people simply calling Sikere and elders. Our results also speak to the evolution of justice institutions in human society. So in Mentawe, we saw that punishment and mediation are, are coordinated by this indigenous institution of justice, this Thulo system. Um, 
Various lines of evidence suggest that for the Mentawe, this justice institution serves foremost to restore dyadic cooperation after a transgression. With my colleague, Leo Fatucci, we've built on this finding in a recent paper to argue that punitive justice often culturally evolves in smaller scale societies um, as people design practices that both restore dyadic cooperation and satisfy victims evolved retributive urges. And in fact, in this publication, we tested this hypothesis, but also with data from two other societies, with the, the Kiowa of the American Great Plains and the Nuer, and we, we mostly found Okay, so uh, to conclude then, I wanna to return to Boaz's most difficult problem of anthropology. So in line with his comment, we found evidence that human societies indeed develop complex socio-cultural traditions, socio traditions with striking cross-cultural similarities. Although, and, and I didn't focus on this so much during this talk, but all of our cross-cultural work also shows that these universal patterns coexist with interesting patterns of diversity. Um, we found evidence that different traditions seem to culturally evolve through different cultural evolutionary processes. So lullabies seem to develop uh, as people selectively retain music that suits infants, shamanism as they selectively develop practices that apparently best control uncertain outcomes, punitive justice as people selectively craft and retain institutions that restore cooperation and satisfy revenge. But I've also argued that we can step back and find some unity in these diverse processes. So on the one hand, all of them are grounded in uh, genetically evolved regularities of human psychology. And particularly, I focus on two, the fact that people pursue fitness relevant goals um, and that they share this, this cognitive architecture of evaluation. We saw this, for instance, in the predisposition to evaluate magic as effective. And I've argued that these two facets give rise to this pro process called subjective cultural selection, which occurs as people craft, adopt, and selectively retain practices that they evaluate as satisfying, satisfying their goals. Now, this process seems to underlie the development potentially of material technology. So spheres, for example, for example, are plausibly evolving as people are selectively retaining technology that they evaluate as, as killing prey, but the same process also seems to explain the, the socio-cultural puzzles that we, that we have considered. That is, these socio-cultural universals appear to develop everywhere as people craft compelling solutions to satisfy their evolved motivations. Okay, so yeah, to, to close out then, there are many people involved in this research. I wanna start by acknowledging my two Mentawe research assistants, Amam Boriogo or Rustam and Amam Jamanu, there are many collaborators, but the, the mentors who helped develop the research um, and supervise and, and organize it are all over here. Richard Rangham, Graham Jones, Joe Henrik, Luke Lowacki, Mascota Delphi. Um, here are the institutions and funding bodies that have supported my work. Here's how to find me online. The code and data for all of my published empirical papers are also available on the open science framework. Um, and I will gladly take any questions if there are any. You can speak with this one. Yeah. And we'll take the first thing. And you can do the question for you. Hi. Okay. So you don't know about shamanism. I wanted to know what the what the equivalent of a shaman in modern society is that in the US. So like do you consider someone like a Donald Trump like this to be a shaman? Is that the equivalent of a shaman in our society? Okay. Should I repeat the question? Yeah. So the question was, um, who are analogs to shamans in contemporary post-industrial rich contexts? Um, yeah, so I think shamans are, uh, 
they're reflecting, they're responding to, they're kind of culturally evolving in, in response to a number of predispositions. Um, it's in one way people uh, performing not necessarily consciously our expectations of people kind of like tr transforming in our eyes to claim petrol abilities to control uncertain outcomes. So I think there are many people who do that. Um, one example that other people have actually talked a lot about are money managers, where um, arguably the market is an, an unpredictable, uncontrollable system. Um, there are arguments that money managers behave at chance, that like throwing darts can, can perform similarly. Um, but it's a system where there is some uh, conviction that there are underlying invisible processes that, that determine it. And so there's a there's a huge gain to be benefit uh, to be to be taken over there. So I think that is a similar psychology where then these people are essentially performing our expectations of an authority. They um, you know use complicated models, they uh, might seem super charismatic. Um, yeah. I think then a lot of people are also another thing shamans are doing is that they are kind of responding to a predisposition to um, draw simplistic causal models about misfortune, and I think a lot of people exploit that. You know, you want you want your economic situation to get better. I blame that on an agent, and then I present myself as special and precisely the way necessary to engage with that that agent. So I think like, yeah, you are kind of economically suffering. It's immigrants. I am special in precisely the way necessary to vanquish that. I think that's a very similar social dynamic. Um, but also, like a lot of people, very explicitly visit shamans. Um, like a couple of weeks ago, I went to a shaman festival outside of Paris. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I was going to the Cambridge Shamanic Circle in 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 um, right up like a couple blocks from Harvard. There was a news a couple months ago that was like in England right now, the religious affiliation that is growing the most rapidly is shamanism. That's what people are writing. Um, but yeah, so I think in, in different ways. Yeah. Sorry? Okay, so you're saying there is social reinforcement for these behaviors. What happens in the absence of that social reinforcement? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so towards for the first question, um, I, I think some kinds of beliefs are, are, are quite robust. So something that I find intriguing about shamans, other religious, magical religious practitioners is, like you mentioned, there are often campaigns to, to eradicate them, to eliminate them. Um, that might be because authorities see them as potentially competitive with their jurisdiction, they have some kind of end. Um, but these are often devilishly sticky and show an incredible 
capacity to reemerge. And there is a lot of interesting research um, on how people will maintain simultaneously different causal frameworks for, for example, illness. So, you know, people might think that illness is caused by witches or some kind of visible agent, et cetera. They might be then given biomedical explanations and really those might be really reinforced, but they will often still maintain these. And I see this in Mentawe where biomedicine is believed to be useful for something like malaria, but then people will say, but the sikere are still very useful for other explanations like sikamein and like a water spirit that, that attacks you. Um, I definitely think like social reinforcement, I, I hope I didn't misunderstand your question, but I think what you were saying, social reinforcement is important. Um, there's really interesting work. Some of the work that I think is the coolest right now is by um, Tanya Lerman at Stanford, where she talks about how um, we really need to think about like people, people are essentially given beliefs and then they interpret their experiences and the framework of those beliefs. And um, it's, it's the really important thing is actually people's experiences that are reinforcing their beliefs very often, but they're kind of given different frames to, to interpret them. So um, what she shows is that like, and what she reviews is that children, for example, are often the most skeptical in a way. They often have the most naturalistic explanations, um, but then through kind of being given certain frameworks and then through their own experiences, uh, they, that those start to get reinforced. If, if that didn't satisfyingly answer your question, I'm glad to also talk afterwards. We have a question online, but uh, Julien don't have any microphone. So we will save the question for him. Uh, Julien is asking, do you encounter any resistance to your research in the current ideological and social climate? Uh, how do you deal with it? In the current climate. Climate, social and political climate. Um, yeah, I encounter some resistance. I encounter resistance of different forms. So for our, our, our music project, for instance, has gotten a lot of resistance from ethnomusicologists who find it, um, see that it doesn't acknowledge a lot of the complexities of, of music in a, in, a, in a given context, um, that it's making generalizations, that it's pushing particular interpretations. Um, what I have found, to be honest, really useful is like having a discourse and having that criticism make the work better. So um, if you saw, we now represent music in four ways. That is partly in response to them saying that staff notation is not useful. Um, so yeah, we, we tried different annotation techniques and, and we actually find that all of them perform pretty similarly in predicting outcomes, but that's uh, you know a, a development that was informed by, by this criticism. We also, in the science paper, have really complicated ways of dealing with ethnographer bias, um, which I think makes that analysis much more useful, but was also inspired by the kinds of criticisms we were getting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, to, for your second question, 
I would have to look back at, so we used, we used um, like ethnographers and ethnomusicologists field notes to determine the, the function. I would have to look back. I'm under the impression that most of them are kind of in the context of a like a romantic context, not to say they're like modern romantic love, but kind of communicating and signaling to a person. I do think even, even so A, I think what you said is very plausible. I would have to look back, but I even think in that sense, it, it's very plausible that in different contexts, communicating love or communicating that you were, you know, an attractive pair mate um, might, involve different emotions or different things you want to signal across cultures. So I think that's very plausible. So your first question was, are there lower level features that are distinguishing these? Yeah. What do you mean? What's an example? Like, for example, uh, voice quality, I suppose that's a framework. And then we can observe it in other frameworks too, that when you are in a different heritage, you can have a romantic relation, then the quality of the voice changes. Or yours, for example, it takes the male's phrase. That seems that seems very plausible. So those are not. I don't think in any of the annotation schemes we actually annotated voice quality. It is the case that all of these annotation schemes do predict song function above chance, but they they're, they're not at a hundred percent. And I think. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. No, that seems very plausible. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, a good point. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Does the shaman are very important for the social cohesion of the group? And what I was wondering, what happens if this shaman is like something that like an empty die or if he did something very wrong? Now they are trusting because there is some shaman with shaman. Well, you're saying in this context yeah. yeah okay yeah um so in mentawi so across societies shamans and similar practitioners are selected in a huge diversity of ways in mentawi or among the mentawi who live in the part of Siberia where i work the most common is um, you'll do it as an adult. Uh, you might do it after you fall very, very sick. Um, and then it's perceived that, you know, many things will, will, will be attempted. And then it's thought that, okay, that the spirits are, are essentially labeling you as, as an initiate. And so they have to start initiating you. And some people can also just by themselves opt to, I want to become a cicada. And then they'll find a teacher. Um, and I mean, in, in all of these conditions, you have to find a teacher. and. You also have to do, you have to learn the songs, you have to learn the dances, you have to learn the herbal remedies. Then you also have to fast, you have to live in the forest. Um, and the ethnography historically, and this you find in other societies, but I've never heard of a case contemporarily where I work, but there are also cases where people suddenly become crazed and they like run into the forest and, or, or you know, they'll say spirits grab them and something happened. Um, that, that, I haven't seen that, yeah. And then the question, what would happen if they disappear? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in Mentawe, or where I work in Seberu, they're, the Sikere are a lot. They are, um, you know, they're religious practitioners. They are um, intermediaries with, with spirits, but they're also like master entertainers. So um, a, sh a shamanic ceremony is very often also just like a really good time. You sacrifice animals, you share them, and then they dance and then everyone's amped up and then everyone else dances and that goes on all night. Um, they're considered repositories of knowledge. Um, they're, of course, they're much more than, than uh, you know, just people who help you deal with spirits for illness. Um, as we saw, they're mediators. What would happen if they were to disappear? I mean, in parts of Siberu, 
there are cicadae who are disappearing. Like the work, where I work is the highest density, but farther down the river, there, there are none. Um, I mean, people sometimes call upon others, but I think like, I think society just reconfigures potentially, you know, you listen to different, maybe that kind of music and performance goes down or, or the way music works goes down, other kinds of mediators emerge. I don't think it's like, I think, yeah, people adapt, they, they engineer, they, yeah. Could you elaborate? So you're saying density dependence for Yeah, so the way that I have come to really think about it in Ment uh, with the Mentawe and this part of Siberu is that um, I think the really important thing is that you have a very dense network where there are long-term relationships that have a lot of history. They're multiplex, so they involve a lot of domains, and then you have this clan structuring. And so what that means, it means a couple of things. One, if I, let's say I get into a conflict with Alex, and I like take Alex's pig. Um, <laughs> now, and, and imagine we're in Mentau, we're in Siberu, not here. Um, then let's say Alex does not pay me my pig. Now that doesn't really affect how you think about how Alex will treat you. You have a very long relationship with Alex that has its own dynamics. Um, Alex's relationship with me is shaped by you know, whose clan married whom, you know, oh, I accused you for this. We've had these witchcraft accusations. So one thing I think about is in a context where you have these really dense multiplex relationships, you can't kind of make trait-based inferences on the basis of people's behavior towards other people that would then affect them. Um, whereas over here, where maybe we have a more fluid social ecology, if you mistreat Alex, then maybe I don't want to interact with you because like there's much more predictive power for how you, you'll interact with me. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I think that's a I think that's an important thing. Uh, another is over there, like the the Thulo system is what's maintaining tr uh, the dyadic bargaining between clans is kind of what's maintaining social order. Over here, you know, we have a dissolution of kin structure. We have to rely on uh, like institutions that hire police. Um, so maybe we're also um, yeah, like handing over uh, enforcement capacity. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you have, you can have very large communities that are kill, still corporate, still based on corporate king groups where corporate king groups essentially bargain and third parties are somewhat indifferent. Like the Somali, the ethnographies of Somali justice where you have these huge, what are called dia paying groups that can have hundreds of members. Um, and I'm not, I maybe this is wrong, but I'm not sure whether third party clans or dia paying groups in those contexts would care. I mean, maybe there is, but yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, yeah. I think if there's no more questions, I think it's the lunch. Thank you very much. We have a few extra tickets for lunch if you want to join. Uh,